probably just uh, quickly get started. Um, so the first thing I want to show you guys is uh, is a little console that I kind of use for for these sessions. Um, so you know we'll be pretty much uh, working through a bunch of. Let me exit my IM clients here so that we don't get the embarrassing messages. All right. So um, you know this is basically just a, a you know a, a sample uh, place where you can just put some little JavaScript snippets and you can run it and see what happens. So you know you can type pieces of script here. I hope it's you know, it's a small enough room. I hope it's visible. Uh, you know you can say alert or whatever. Like you can write little pieces of script there and you know hit control enter and it will run it. Alerts typically annoying. So you can you know say print. So these are just like you know built-in ready functions that you can use to uh, try out stuff. So when you say print, it comes on the right hand side over there. Uh, zoom it a little bit. Yeah. Alright, uh, so, you know, if you have like invalid code and whatnot, uh, it shows up in the bottom right hand corner as an error. Uh, that's all right. So, that's what this uh, this console does. What about DOM? Yeah, I mean, so this, you can access the browser DOM. So, if you want to, you know, print, uh, or let's say alert, document, dot body, dot other HTML, you know, all that works. That's interesting HTML, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so that's basically the the ace editor. So this this editor that you're seeing, maybe I don't know how how much you can see the color and stuff. So this does indenting, uh, syntax highlighting, you know, all that nice things. So this is basically an editor that the Mozilla team has put. Uh, there's a Mozilla Ace project where they use this uh, editor for uh, you know, for basically you can create an ID. So have you have you heard of Cloud9 ID? How many of you have heard of Cloud9? So that's basically an ID on the web, right? And it's very popular for building node apps and stuff. So, you know, the, the, the editor is basically, uh, again, uh, it's obviously a you know, text box, the JavaScript and whatnot. So this is basically a, a Mozilla uh, project. So I've integrated that here. So that little snippet that, I don't know what that is, but it works. I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so so that's the, uh, that's the console, right? All right, so. <clears throat> What can we talk about? Uh, so, so before I go to go to the, you know, maybe before I talk about functions. Uh, so, is there is there anything that you guys want to talk about? Is there, uh, you know, some burning issue that you you run into, uh, you know, that you think? Uh, yeah. One thing. If anybody has any question, please raise your hand. I'll pass on the mic. Yeah. So that way, you know, this is getting recorded. It's supposed the, to be a discussion. Yeah. So on the on the video, you know, we can hear the question. So. Uh, so yeah, so if you have questions, if you have questions now, ask. You know, can we talk about it, or as we go along, you know, maybe you'll have questions. First, can we just set your mic? Is it on? Is the light on on this? Okay. Um, all right. So <coughs> functions, right? Um, so maybe we can we can talk a little bit about functions. We can see the volume. So it, it turns out that in JavaScript, uh, functions are are a first class citizen in the language. Right? You can use functions pretty much anywhere. You can use, uh, I don't know, variables. Right? So what can you typically do with variables? So you can you can declare them. You can assign values to them. You can take variables and pass them to functions. You can return variables from functions. Right? So a bunch of things that you can do with any kind of variable. I mean, if you say var, uh, you, say, you say var a, and then you can, there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. Turns out, functions in JavaScript are exactly the same. Uh, most, I mean, uh, pretty much, right? Pretty much exactly the same as a variable. Pretty much wherever you can use a variable, you can use a function. So what can you do with functions? Obviously, you can declare functions. So you can say function foo. Uh, you know, you can. All right. So you can say, I don't know, print foo. Right. So that's that's a function declaration, and uh, you can obviously call them. Right. It turns out you can assign functions to variables. So for example, I can say var f equals foo. And now it turns out f becomes an alias for this function, right? Another reference for that exact same function. Uh, so I can I can do that, and that works as well, right? But why is it printing twice? I keep hitting control and control and control. If you so, for example, I'll just put a clear here. Uh, so you know, just to bring your attention that that's printing. Uh, 
Um, <coughs> so you can you know create alias for a function, call it through that through that alias. Um, what else can it do? So you can create a function like that, right? And you can pass a function as an argument to another function. So I can I can say, for example, I can say foo of, right? Or probably let me say function uh, print foo, right? And then here I'll say foo. Now I can say foo of print foo, right? So in the, in the maybe I'll, I'll print too many foos, then put foo. Okay, so um, you know, this is no different from the earlier case where we just assigned a function to another variable. Right? Sorry? Zoom, Zoom more? It's not visible at the back. A little more. Huh? A little more. So if I go anymore, I think this thing will go away. Okay, that's it. Thanks. There's more seats in the front if folks wanna you know, sit here or if I there are seats here, you can sit there. <laughs> Um, all right, so yeah, so you can pass functions to uh, you know as, as parameters to other functions, right? What else can you do with them? Uh, can you return functions from functions? What do you think? Of course. Of course. All right, so let's do that. So I go here, I get rid of all this. So I'll say I now make func or something, right? So here I'll say return function and. Uh, I'll say return uh, inner function, and that's it, right? So now I can say var f equals make func, and uh, I can call it, right? So you can see that it prints. Um, <clears throat> now this opens up some interesting, uh, interesting use cases, right? Now let's say I, I pass a, I pass a variable here, right? And uh, and I say a equals ten and return a. Uh, no wait, maybe I'll say print a, right? A equals a, and uh, that's it. This doesn't matter. So maybe here I'll say print of ten. Now what will this? Uh, so when I call f here, what will it do? That should be pretty obvious, right? It will print a equals ten. Um, let's do something else. What happens if I say var b equals uh, one, and I say b plus plus b? Right? This doesn't matter now. I'm not using a. So what's gonna what's it gonna print? Can I call f now? Sorry? Sorry? It will print two. Any other answers? Print one. Print one. Two. Undefined, maybe? Undefined. 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 All right. So we have all possible answers now. So let's find out. Yeah. Um, I hit. So it does print two, right? What What will happen if I call it a few times? Will it print two, 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 or two, two, two? It will keep increasing. It keep increasing. All right. So yes, it, it does indeed keep increasing, right? Now. How many of you think this is weird? Why is it weird? Okay, fair enough. So p was not defined inside this function. B was defined. I mean, defined in the containing function. I mean, what's really? I mean, even that maybe I can you know. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's still visible in in the scope of that function and it'll define whatever. B is instantiated inside. It is defined instantiated inside make func. Huh, so it is initialized inside make func to 1. Yeah, that's why it is incremental. Correct. But every time the inner function is being called, it's not the auto function. Exactly. Please use the mic if you have any questions. Yes. <laughs> any logical improbability in a function reference when um, written that way, forms a closure, so uh, the reference to the variable is maintain as long as the reference to the function is maintained so exactly i mean that's the that's the correct uh, that's the explanation for why i mean why we see what is happening here right um, it's a it's a closure now what do we mean by that so here i mean when i was you know trying to figure this out the weirdest thing for me was um, so in javascript 
the, the construct that defines scope for variables is a function, right? Or, or any symbol is a function. So when you define something inside a function, when that function is called and it returns, that variable is gone, right? That that's, that defines the lifetime of that particular uh, particular variable. <coughs> I mean, it's a reference counted system and all that is still still applies. But in this particular case, when make func is returning, I mean, once make func is is over, right? And in line eleven, b is gone, right? And when I call f here, I'm still accessing b, right? Now, how are we able to, so if this was, I don't know, C++, uh, you know, undefined behavior, right? Probably it'll just, it'll just crash, uh, or probably it'll work, which is even worse. Um, <clears throat> so here, um, so as, as that gentleman said, this, basically how this is working is through something called as a closure, right? So basically when you define a function, uh, whatever symbols, whatever variables, uh, you know, Parameters to the fitness, uh, to that function, whatever is, uh, is visible in scope at that particular time, becomes part of what is known as the closure for that particular function. So you can imagine a closure as being like a hidden member for that uh, for that particular function in question, right? Um, so I mean, how many of you here are only? I mean, have, how many of you have done C++, uh, C sharp, Java? Right. So that's that's good. Uh, because there are many aspects of JavaScript which are which look like you know they work the same way in, in static type languages like C sharp, JavaScript, and C++. They don't, right? So some gotchas. So probably you know we'll we'll see how many we are able to talk about. Uh, that, that's kind of sound ominous, right? How many can we talk about in one hour? So how many do you have, <laughs> right? Uh, lots. In fact, uh, uh, you know there there is if you want to know what you know what is the definitive book to learn JavaScript. Okay, there's a book called the Definitive uh, uh, JavaScript uh, book, and that's about that thick. It's a really, really thick book. And then um, there is this gentleman named Douglas Crockford. He works for Yahoo. He's on the ECMAScript uh, committee, uh, standards committee, and whatnot. He's written a book called JavaScript: The Good Parts. That's about that thick. Right. So you have Definitive JavaScript and good parts. So what about the rest of JavaScript? Right. So <clears throat> yeah. So JavaScript. I mean, the, the rest of JavaScript is probably part of the reason why a lot of people passionately hate JavaScript. Um, but I think there are enough good things about JavaScript to, to fall in love with it. Um, so, you know, I lost track of what I talked about. So we're talking about closures, right? Um, so that, that's what's happening here. So when you call function like this, uh, it becomes part of the part of the uh, part of the closure for that particular function. Now, from a C++ or a JavaScript, uh, Java or, or, or C# -sharp background, right? You you write classes, right? You write classes, and you have classes which are member uh, member. Uh, fields, members, methods, and whatnot. Um, so you can do the same thing here, right? So for example, I can. Um, you probably written code like this, right? So you say, uh, I don't know, maybe person name comma age. I'll say this dot name is n. This dot age is a. And then you write code like this, right? Var p equals new person of two and ten, right? Now you are able to say p dot name, uh, and you are able to say Print is this okay, p dot h should be a semicolon. Error. Yeah, it should be. Oh. All right. So it prints uh, foo and, and ten over here. Right. So this this is something that we are used to, and this is something that we do in uh, in other languages. Right. You define a class. Class has member fields. Probably you define some member methods, and then you instantiate that object. Now. The funny thing is, this syntax that you're seeing here, this is not JavaScript. I mean, obviously, this is JavaScript. I've, I've written JavaScript, but the, I, uh, you know, when JavaScript as a language was, uh, you know, was being defined and implemented and whatnot, a long time back in Netscape, um, you know what the hottest language at that point in time was? Java. It was Java, right? Uh, it, that's funny because you know we, we call this language JavaScript, but it has nothing to do with Java. There is, you know, it, it is probably in the same uh, syntactic lineage as C and C++. You know, you have curly braces and, and all that. Uh, but this is this has nothing to do with Java, right? In fact, uh, uh, I remember like there was this conference, uh, you know, sometime back in in, in US. In, in, it's called Mix from from Microsoft. Uh, so Douglas Crockford and you know a few other uh, folks were there, and there was this panel, this JavaScript panel, you know, basically just discussing geeking out about JavaScript. Uh, so somebody said, you know, that JavaScript people say that it's a scripting language, right? And when you say it's a scripting language, it seems to mean that you know it's, it's somehow limited in scope or functionality. You know, probably it's a special-purpose language that can be used only in certain scenarios. 
you know, there is this connotation or, or this, you know, uh, we, we, we think about scripting languages in those terms. And, and the point was that JavaScript is not. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Turing complete language, a general purpose language, you can use it for pretty much anything and we are finding that it's actually being used for uh, things that it was never planned or intended to be used in, right? Using it for server side. <coughs> so, that is proper said, you know. So we all know that uh, it's not Java and you're saying it's not a scripting language, then the language is named completely wrong, right? We call it JavaScript. It's not Java, it's not scripting. Um, so which is actually correct, right? Uh, in fact, the, the standard name for the language, anybody know what is the standard name for the language? ECMA script, ECMAScript, right? Which I think is a very ugly name. I prefer JavaScript to ECMAScript. Uh, <coughs> so, again, got distracted. Yeah, so this, this syntax here, I, I spoke about Java and all because this syntax here was, uh, was incorporated into the language to appeal to Java folks. So, Java people see this line here. Uh, var p equals new person and they will be very happy. Right? This, look, this looks like Java, except for the var, which is kind of a, a worry, but you know what, I can live with that. The rest of it looks like Java. Turns out that, you know, this has nothing to do with JavaScript. This is basically something that was introduced in the language to keep these people happy. Um, so, JavaScript is, is a language that is known as a prototype based language. Um, you know what, why do we say that? So, we, you know what, this, this particular code, if I was uh, writing it the way JavaScript is meant to be used, I would probably write it something like this. I'll say var, uh, I don't know, uh, person proto, right? And I'll say uh, name is, I don't know, uh, non, it doesn't matter what the initial values are. So let's say I do that. And then if I want to instantiate a new person, I'll do something like this. I'll say object dot create of I just get rid of all this stuff in the top. So you say object of create of person underscore proto. Right? And now of course you can do the same thing that you did before. Uh, so I just copy that, paste that, maybe I call this two. Right? And uh, it, it prints none and ten. So so what is the difference between these two, uh, you know, these two kinds of syntax that you're seeing over here and over here? Uh, the, uh, technically, there is no difference. Okay. Uh, the the key thing is, in this particular case, we are explicitly stating that P2 here is an object whose proto, which is basically a, uh, you know, a, uh, how many of you here uh, know the design pattern prototype? Alright. So do you want to give it a shot? What is what is the prototype? Pardon? Uh, Wait for the mic. In product-based uh, programming, there is nothing called class. So everything is an object. Even functions, variables, everything is an object. Yes. And, uh, so typically objects uh, we instantiate from classes. Right? So here, other objects will be instantiated from other objects. Another object. Exactly. Right. So, uh, so prototype is a is a creational design pattern, which is basically a, you know a way of implementing software systems where you want to solve the problem of creating objects in a particular way. And the prototype design pattern uh, prescribes that you create objects by cloning other objects, which are prototype instances. So you basically set up one object, which is an object that you know you want all instances of that particular uh, you can't say type because you don't have a type. As you said, you have objects. Uh, so you set up one ideal prototype instance. And then whenever you need a new object, you clone that. Right? So this this pattern is called as a prototype uh, creational pattern. I was add something to that. Yes. Uh, so like every object has something called a prototype chain. Uh, it's kind of like how you, if you're programming in Java, C++, there's a base class, and that base class might have another base class. It's kind of similar to that, but you don't have to instantiate uh, stuff here. That's only different. Yeah. So I'll be a little little like a devil's advocate here and put, yeah. put up a question. The first syntax looks like I'm coming from, imagine I'm coming from Java. It's so familiar. Why should I even think of object.create and creating a prototype object? Hmm. I, mean, I mean, it's the, so alien to me. The primary reason is this particular syntax here is misleading. It seems to indicate to the developer or whoever is you know, looking at the code that, I mean, this, this so looks like there is a type called person and looks like I'm instantiating an object of that particular type. As in, we are, we are trying to, I mean, the, the code looks like we are doing something which it's not, right? It's basically uh, lipstick on pig, right? So we are trying to make the language look like something that's not, right? Um, so, I mean, you would be forgiven for thinking that we are creating an instance of a type here, right? 
So wh what is JavaScript? Uh, so there are languages can be classified as strongly typed or <coughs> not, right? So what is JavaScript? It's, it's definitely not strongly typed. Somebody said weakly typed. So it is, it is a weakly typed language, right? So how many types? I mean, you can probably count on a fingers number of types in, in JavaScript, right? Probably let's, let's just uh, call it out. What are the types in JavaScript? Yeah. Integer, numbers, number, number, boolean, ob, object. That's not about object. But undefined. yeah, that's the type. Huh? Undefined. Undefined. I mean, what is syntax, right? How you declare variables? I mean, number, number, string, date, uh, functions, uh, objects, and so on, right? Null. Is null a type? I have no idea. It's a single term. Sorry? It's a single term. It's null, a type with only one instance. Null is an object. Null is an object. Yes. In fact, if you say type of null, you get an object. <coughs> so, and, and the most ubiquitous type in JavaScript is probably object, right? Raj, doesn't that make this still a static type language? Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it's still a strong type, but it's a stat dynamic language. Yeah. No, it's it's not definitely not strong type. So, for example, there is it's no... It's a type. It's weakly type and it's... But if it's weakly language. type, it means then the objects change their nature depending on how you want to use them. Exactly. They it do. does. They, they do. There is an object version. If you do 1 plus in quotes 2, it will try to convert the quotes 2 to number 2 and you will get 3. Or the other way around. I don't know what will happen. Yeah. Depends on the, the order you put them. Yeah. That, that still happens. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know what? I don't even try to remember all that. Yeah. We <laughs> should. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so it's called a weakly typed language because you know there are these types and nothing else. So you can't create your own types, and you know uh, objects can dynamically change types. In fact, uh, in fact, this is probably going a little too deep. Like in, when when you talk about implementing the JavaScript language itself in JavaScript runtimes, um, how do, how do they? How do they implement uh, implement types inside, right? So, so when you when you do this, when you say var o equals that, so I'm just creating a, an empty object here, and then I say o dot uh, m1 is 10, right? And then I say o dot m2 equals 20. Right. Um, so, so actually, what is happening here is internally, right? The JavaScript runtime actually creates uh, creates types. It depends on implementation. Probably I can I can speak to IE's implementation chakra. Um, so. You know, internally it does create a create a type, right? As users of the language, they don't need to know about this at all. But uh, but as an optimization, right? The JavaScript runtime would go ahead and you know this would probably be the empty object. As soon as you create a member called M1, it would create a type called let's say T1, which with one member called M1, right? And then when I say O dot M2, then it would actually create type T2, which inherits from T1 and has an extra member called M2, right? So basically, the, this is basically an optimization technique. Uh, so the idea here is to, uh, you know, when when you say O dot some member, right? Uh, how do you how do you resolve access to that member? Uh, Aditya was talking about a prototype chain, right? Um, so here, for example, I'm saying P2 equals uh, object dot create of person proto, and I'm saying P2 dot name and P2 dot age. Now the the question to ask is, uh, where are these members, right? So when you say P2 dot name, where is uh, where is name defined? That, that member name, where is it defined? It's defined in the prototype, right? Uh, so let's say I go and say p2 dot gender equals f, right? Now, <coughs> now where is gender defined? P2. On p2, right? Now let's say I go and create p3 equals object dot create of p2, right? So what <coughs> what is exactly happening here? So JavaScript is a product language. Now what we mean by that is any any given object in JavaScript has a prototype associated with that object, right? So in case of uh, P2, the prototype associated with P2 is person proto. In case of P3, the prototype associated with P3 is P2, right? And when you say P2 dot, let's say uh, print P2 dot, uh, sorry, P3 dot name, right? What exactly does the runtime do? So in this case, what JavaScript runtime would do is could go and see if there is a property called name on P3, right? On the object P3 directly. Has it been created on P3? Uh, in this case, the answer would have would have to be no, right? So then the runtime would look at P3's prototype. What is P3's prototype? P2. Does P2 have a name? No, it does not have a name. 
So what is P2 prototype? P2 prototype, person prototype, person prototype have a name? Yes. Now let's say, let's say I say P3 dot bar, right? In this case, what would happen? It would again walk the chain. So it would go all the way up to person proto. It will check whether that has bar. No, it does not have bar. Then it will see person proto's prototype. What do you think is person proto's prototype? Object. Object. Right? Object prototype. In fact, uh, we can prove that. So in, in ECMAScript 5, which is the latest production version of standard uh, JavaScript, I can do something like this. So I can say person object dot get prototype of, and I can say person proto. So object dot get prototype of is a is a function which to which if you pass a, an object, it will return the prototype of that particular object. So I can say get prototype of person proto, and I'll check. Oops, oops. And I'll check if that is equal to object dot prototype. Uh, that came from syntax error. O dot mem. All right. Man, I have too much stuff here. What does three equals do? Sorry. What does three equals? Yes. Good question. Very observant. Um, let me get rid of all these other prints. All right, so it, it prints true, right? And let me zoom back in. Um, so, you know, person, so if, if an object by default, you don't explicitly associate a prototype, the prototype of an object is object's prototype. And what is object's prototype's prototype? Object. As in, what if I put this here? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Let's get rid of this. Uh, I didn't print anything. Is undefined maybe? No, it's not undefined. It's not undefined. So it's uh, it's null, right? So that's where the bug stops, right? It stops with object of prototype. Now, Kiran had a question. Uh, you know, again, if you are from a C++ and other other languages, that looks weird, right? That looks like a syntax error. Uh, <clears throat> one too many equals. Anybody know what that is? Strict comparison, right? Uh, so as uh, you know, I'll give you an example earlier, right? So he said, uh, let's see, if I say print one equals one, what do you think it will print? How many? How many of you say it will print true? How many say it will print false? Others are unsure. So let's see. Sure. Take all that. See now. So it prints true, right? How many of you think this is correct? Nobody thinks, a oh, couple of you think it's correct. Oh, weekly it is correct. Sorry? Oh, weekly that language is correct. Oh, weekly that language is correct. You know what? I think it's wrong. <laughs> In my opinion, it's personal opinion. Okay? I shouldn't do this. Uh, the, the thing here is... Isn't right or wrong, it's confusing. It's confusing. That's, that's the biggest it's point. Confusing. See, it's confusing. Uh, there is this principle of, you know, whenever you're designing, it applies to everything in software. Whenever you're designing software, designing your, you know, the principle of least surprise. So, don't do anything that will surprise people. Look, what just happened, right? Don't do that. Make it so that things that uh, look like what they'll do, actually do what they look like they'll do, right? Uh, so, that, that's, that's a good way of designing software. Right, uh, you know, this is like you know, some people will have funny way of naming APIs. In fact, Microsoft is getting to doing this a lot, a lot of time. You know, APIs will say, you know, uh, create purchase order and they'll do, go do something else. Right. <coughs> so, um, so that, that, that's the that's the problem here. So it looks like this shouldn't work, but it actually ends up working. So the you know, you if you want strict comparison where uh, it can, it doesn't do this implicit type conversion, that's what is happening here. I don't know which is happening. Maybe one is becoming a string or the string is becoming a number. But in either case. Type conversion, implicit type conversion is happening and it's doing the comparison and it's resolving to true. Uh, if you say, you know, triple equals, then. So, as a, as a best practice, just just use triple equals. You know, don't even try <laughs> using double equals. Uh, so, there's another wart in JavaScript. Um, what else? <clears throat> yeah, so so that's that's the prototype chain thing we're talking about, right? So, objects, they, um, so, you know, they have these prototype chains. Now the only thing that's slightly different from the design pattern that I was telling you about earlier is that the uh, when you talk about prototypes, it doesn't really actually clone in JavaScript, right? It's actually every object has a reference to the prototype object, 
right? It's not actually creating a completely new object, copying all the members, and now you have a completely new object which is disconnected from another object. That's not the case. What actually happens is there is this hidden member, uh, which is the prototype of that particular object. So in this case, for example, P2 has a hidden member, which is a prototype, and that is basically person underscore proto. It's a reference. Now, you, you, might, you might wonder, you know, uh, that opens up some interesting questions, doesn't it? What happens if I say p2 dot name equals uh, bar, right? And then I say print person underscore proto dot name. So in this particular line, when, when I was talking about name resolution rules, what the JavaScript runtime would do is it would go and see if p2 has a property called name. No, nope, it does not. Then it will go see if p2's prototype has a property called name. That it does. And then that's what you're accessing, right? So in this case, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Print. So I have assigned a value to p2.name, <coughs> and then I am doing this. None? None? Oh yeah, so none you're saying. Okay, sorry. Uh, some of you said bar, right? So let's see what it does. It prints none. So, what do you think happened just, just now? It created a new member called name. Correct. So, when you when you said Peter name, it created a new member called name, right? Now let's do. So that's that's good, right? That's good news. If it if this had become Baha, I would have been really shocked, right? That that would be like a, a surprise. Um, so this is good. Now let's say I go and do something like this. Address. Uh, street is street one. City is China, right? So I have. I have a member which is actually another object inside person dot proto, right? Now I go and say print p2 dot address dot street, so that works perfectly fine as we expected to. Then I say p2 dot address dot uh, street equals <coughs> Mumbai something, right? And I print it prints Mumbai, so that's great. Now let's say person dot proto dot address dot Okay. Now what do you guys think? Like the fact that I'm asking the question should you know mean that it's probably not going to do what it did earlier. Uh, actually, you can see that print Mumbai, right? So <clears throat> another what, <word. laughs> right? So this is this is again part of the reason why people hate JavaScript. So. What happened here? So when you said p2 dot address dot street in any other language, I mean this, this, uh, you know, you're completely okay with this because you are actually assigning it on the new instance. But here, if you look at the, you know, if you remember the the JavaScript name resolution rules, it will actually make sense because when you say p2 dot address here, what are we doing? We are accessing the value or we are writing to it. Accessing. We are accessing the value. So does p2 have address? It does not. So which address does it give? The prototype's address, right? And then we are assigning to that. So now, in fact, at that point, we are assigning to the prototype, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, right? So if you are, if you are using object or create, uh, you have to remember this, right? If you have nested objects inside the prototype object, you, you need to remember to uh, clone it. So in fact, in many many frameworks, you know, they create a you know a, a clone method. This is not part of the standard. So people go ahead and create it themselves. They basically walk the object graph, right? You can just say clone or something, and what they do is um, they just walk, you know walk the object graph and see what, if there are nested objects, and then it basically create a copy of that object uh, in turn. Would you have has has own property method that we can check on? Yes, there is. We can check that, and we can write it. Yes. Same thing, but yes. Oh, yeah. I was just asking about the has no property of object. Correct. So yeah. So uh, so the, just as we saw object dot get prototype off, there is another method called as uh, object dot has own property. All right. Uh, so this is just a way of you know uh, reflecting on object. So for example, uh, so here I can say print object dot has own property of uh, p2 comma address. Right? And uh, what do you think is going to print? It prints false. And which is absolutely correct because P2 does not have 
an own property called address on on that particular object. So uh, if I say gender, it also says false. Where does it say false? I have no idea why it's the false. I was expecting it to say true because gender is a property on P2, right? It is an own property on P2. Let's see. See, there you go. It does give gender. So there is another other method called uh, called keys on the object object. So you can say object dot keys and pass a pass a parameter and it will give you what are all the members on that. That is own members on that object. So for example, let me get rid of this thing here. Confusing the output. So there you can see that it prints gender, right? So that's not the only member in P2. You can still access name and age, but object dot keys returns only own properties. Or maybe I did a typo. Let's try this again. Own property P2 gender. Sorry. The old classical way is P2 dot has own property. So good, good. Instead of object dot has own property. Key is true. Let's You remove this first one. The problem with implementation. Really? I'd be surprised if that was the case. Can we try out some of the problems? question. You mentioned the object dot clone method. Yeah. Uh, let's say the proto object uh, which we have uh, has a couple of functions. How does the cloning work there? So functions are all by reference. So, oh, you're saying how, how can we clone if it's a function? Function you wouldn't want to clone, right? That would just be by reference. So that's what would happen. The cloning would contain the function, only the data. It only the data. Yeah. So, yeah, let's let's try it in Chrome and see what Chrome does. I mean, if it is a, this is IE ten platform preview four, so expect bugs. Um, <coughs> so that's it, right? So I have to say, okay, this will definitely get say true, yeah. and then, come on. Uh -oh. Acting up. You know what? I've been having this problem since yesterday. So here we have object of true. So now I say object of has own property p2. It says false. All right. I'll, I'll look it up. I don't know why it does that. Um, so so that's that. What else? Um, so so yeah. So you know if you have nested objects remember, and if you're using prototype creation, remember to clone it. Um, so those are some of the things that I want to talk about 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 functions and kind of kind of you know didn't really kind of stick to that. Um, we already talked about closures. Another thing that I kind of wanted to talk about is uh, is variable ho it's, it's an idea called as variable hoisting, which is again something that uh, that trips people up. So I'll just get rid of all this stuff here. Um, so let's write some code. So I say function foo here. Okay. Um, I say if one equals one, right? It's a completely useless if statement. Here I'll say var uh, a equals ten, right? And here I say print a. So again, it's up for a vote. In JavaScript, much of it, you know, if it, unless you run it, uh, and if I if I put it to vote, I'll get all possible answers. <laughs> so gentleman says ten. Undefined. undefined. Good. So you are you know, you're, you're getting the idea. So it could print undefined, right? No, that's I think uh, that's just a best practice warning. So you know this this is the Mozilla editor thing. In Firefox, other features start lining up. So in in fact, that's that's good. You should pay attention to that. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Anyway, so um, uh, undefined and, and and ten. Those are the options. Uh, 
Good. I was checking if you guys are paying attention. So, <laughs> hip and stem, right? I don't know what to tell you. I mean, Jasper seems broken, right? I mean, I've declared this inside this if, but I'm still able to access it outside the if, right? In pretty much any other language, what defines, so basically it boils down to this, what defines, control, uh, you know, scope, scoping for variables? Curly braces, right? In, in C sharp C -sharp, Jasper, uh, Java, when you define a curly brace, whatever you declare inside of that, is not in the outside of the curly brace. Not so JavaScript. JavaScript is different. So here, how how does this work? So this this concept is called as variable hosting. In fact, this is a feature in the language, right? Um, see, if I can, I, so I'm, I'm declaring. I mean, I'm calling foo here, right? Can I call foo here? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. No. Yes. No. Let's see. If I put it to vote, I get all answers. Actually, the answer is yes, right? I can I can call it. I can call foo here and then define it later. Right? This is the feature. Right? So JavaScript allows you to do stuff like this, where you don't have to declare something before you use it, as long as you have declared it somewhere. Um, <coughs> it's not as loose as that. There are some rules around it. But you know, this this is a feature that is designed that this this whole thing that we're talking about. You know, it was created for that. But it has these other interesting side effects, which are again surprising. Um, it turns out that in JavaScript, the only construct, the language construct, that defines scope for a variable is a function, right? And no other control block will introduce with does introduce uh, 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 scoping, but don't use with. If you don't know about with, don't try to learn about it. <laughs> right? it's, it's one of the bad things in, in JavaScript, like eval. Eval is evil. Don't use eval. Um, <clears throat> in fact, this this console uses eval. <laughs> like whatever I type and I hit control enter, it's with eval. Also, with. might be even using it. No, I didn't, use, I, I didn't use with. Okay. I just take the text from the text box and pull it. But actually, you're right. I should, I could, I could probably use with. Um, <clears throat> so, question, uh, yeah. if you change that function foo to var foo equal to function, oh. it becomes slightly different. It does what would be the behavior now? Right. And probably ask the audience first before you answer. All right. So I say var foo equals function blah, right? Uh, why are there so many explanations? It doesn't tell me what it is. Right. So var foo equals function and uh, some code, right? And I'm calling it. So what, what do you think is going to happen here? Sorry? Anonymous function, uh, error you mean. You get an error. It's not an error. Let's just run it, that'll be easier. Uh, we got error. Because foo is not a function. There is a difference between function declaration and function expression. That function itself is not assigned to it until you reach that. Let me, let me change this slightly, right? So, I just say bar, right? What do you think will come now? And this I don't think I'll get different answers. Bar is undefined. Yeah, I would say bar is undefined, right? Let's just run this and see what error we get. It says bar is not defined. You will note that for foo we did not get that error. For foo, what we get is foo is not a function. Oh, so foo is something else, right? In case of bar, it says it's not defined. I mean, I don't even know what you're talking about. Go declare it first. That's what it's telling us. Whereas with foo, it's saying, hold on a second, foo is not a function. Don't try to call it like a function, which implicitly means that it's something else, right? Um, so, what I'm getting at is that there is this concept called as variable hoisting in, in JavaScript, which basically enables this functionality where you can declare something later on and then you can use it before you uh, have, before it is actually, uh, I mean, the, 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 the runtime basically parses your code and defines all your declarations and then it runs your code, right? Um, <clears throat> so, what is happening here is, in fact, to, to demonstrate this, I'll probably go back to my older example. It will be slightly clearer in that. So I'll say foo here. So this this prints uh, 10, I thought. Okay, I'll call it. All right, so this prints 10. And uh, let, let, me, let me slightly change this. I mean, going back to that same example. Let me slightly change this and, uh, and do something like this. I say print of A here. What do you think it will print now? It says 10. 
undefined. Undefined. Something is not defined. Type is married. Correct. That's the correct answer, right? In fact, the same thing that we did earlier. I did var foo equals function and then called it before, right? It's the exact same scenario here. Um, maybe I'll just say type of a. So it says it's undefined. What do you think it will happen if I say type of b? And that's not undefined. In fact, that's that's an error. Okay. So it's the same scenario, right? B does not even exist. It's not been defined yet. Uh, therefore, you can't use it. Whereas with A, it doesn't say that. It says it's undefined. So this code that you're seeing here, the runtime will go ahead and sneakily change it to something like this. So that's what is actually happening, right? You've declared the variable in your source code inside your if and initialize it to a certain value. The JavaScript runtime will go take all your declarations from the entire scope, put it all to the top, declare it there, and you'll notice that it's only the declarations. The initialization still happens where you declare it. Right? Inside the I mean the A becomes 10 only inside this. Here it's just declared. That's why here you're seeing, I mean this code you can reason about, right? Now you know why it says undefined. I've just declared the variable, I've not initialized it, therefore it's undefined. Uh, whereas and, and also you can now say, you know, why this happens. Why does it say 10 there, right? Obviously, it will say 10 because it's declared there inside the if I initialize the 10, now it prints 10. So this is what is actually happening under the ground. So this this uh, under the cover. So this is called as variable hosting. So anything that you declare. So so what is the best practice around this, right? Anybody want to take a guess at what the best practice is around around this? Just declare them up. Variables in. Just declare them up. Yeah. So the best practice is not to do it, right? Don't declare anything anywhere other than at the top of the function. Right? Um, so that's that's another what if you want to think about it. It's a feature that has become a what. <coughs> Alright. So um, in yeah. fact there is another thing that you could do. Yeah, I have a, I have a good have that point there. Like uh, if you if you want to run a piece of code, right? This typically you do in, in your web, web applications, right? You typically you want to run some piece of code as the page loads. As soon as the page loads, you want some, some script to run. Right? And typically you want to declare variables, right? So how do you do that? So, you know, a lot of times we, we do some, something like this, right? So we say, uh, so we'll say, you know, HTML, and we'll say script, and then here you go and, you know, write your code, you know, uh, document dot blah blah blah, you go and write that there, right? Maybe you will you will go and say var a and, and do something with a, right? So, this obviously is not good, because as soon as you say var a, first of all, this, this becomes a global, right? The A becomes available throughout your web application, and that's definitely not good. And uh, secondly, you have these all hosting issues. Uh, <coughs> so the better way to do this is to use something called as an immediately invoked function expression. So do something like this. So function, right? Define a function and call it. Now here you do whatever you have to do. Document dot blah blah blah. Right? So what is this? What is the syntax? This is too big. What is the syntax here? Um, so basically. This piece should be pretty self-evident, right? I've just defined a, an anonymous function, right? And I've encapsulated it inside a couple of, you know, brackets. So that basically the entire expression evaluates to a function, right? An anonymous function. And then I'm instantly, immediately invoking it. Uh, you know, many times in, 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 you know, in like when you're reading word in blocks and stuff, people call this as a self-executing function, right? And that's technically wrong. This is not a self-executing function. As in the function doesn't execute itself. Right? This is a function which is defined as invoked immediately. Right? We are defining it here and calling it here. It would be self-executing if I did something like, I don't know, arguments dot callie dot caller. Right? Uh, so if I did that, basically if I recursively call that function, then it's self-executing. It's not self-executing. This is immediately invoked. Just a little technicality. So you know, this this basically makes sure that these things don't get leaked into global scope. Whatever you declare there. And then, of course, for uh, for the hosting issue, declare everything at the top of the room. In fact, in, in ES6, the next revision of, uh, of of the language, they are trying to you know deal with this problem of uh, you know the, uh, you know basically they want to basically do what everybody does. Curly braces will introduce scoping for variables. So that's bad. Yeah. You prefer this? No, no, no. So there's another keyword being introduced for that. You won't be using value. Yes. Using lit for that. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so it depends. It's quite explicit when you use yes. those words. Yes. 
So, the yeah. question again, yeah. David said, okay, let's say if I took your last example and moved food to one script block and okay. have declaration in a script block after that, okay. will the hoisting work across script tags or will it be inside one script Good tag? Good question. I don't know. I'm sure people, these things people should know. I know the obvious answer, but. What is the answer? I don't know. I think it's just script uh, tag level. It doesn't go on the page right. level. So that the each script tag, I mean, it's its own uh, score. Yeah. <coughs> Did everybody get that? Alright. So, um, so that's a little, little best practice. Immediately invoke functions. In fact, in many of the libraries, jQuery and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, you will find that this this kind of code is used a lot. <coughs> All right, so uh, I, mean, I have a bunch of other talking points here. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? If we have like another five minutes to go. But Any questions? Or we can continue with this. Yeah. Hi, Raj. Hey. I know that guy. Yeah. So, uh, by self-executing, uh, I don't think uh, I mean, the way it's set self executing is the function is um, the particular piece of code gets loaded initially and then it gets executed there itself. It's Correct. not that someone else is calling it because of it. So I think that's the reason why, uh, even in those aspect techniques, John Hussey says it's like self executing and anonymous function. No, what he says is that it's, it's kind of a vague statement. It can be misinterpreted. When you say ah. what he's, the words he's using, it's it's more explicitly so, so is it because uh, of the confusion between recursion and uh, self executing? Yes, right. Typically, if you say self executing, you know, there is this idea that that's a function which calls itself, right? So when you say it's immediate function, then what, you know, basically it's just a different terminology just to distinguish between these two cases. So you're saying the people should be aware that, uh, I mean, it's different from recursion. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Questions? What are the cases where we would need a global variable if you want some variable to be having a global scope? Is that the question? What are the cases like which would demand us to use global variables? Can you give some examples? Very, very few. If you if you go out of this session believing that you never use global variables, you wouldn't be wrong. Uh, but I mean, so so. JavaScript does not have the concept of modules, right? So you cannot, uh, like for example, Java has packages, uh, C# -sharp has namespaces, C++ has namespaces. Java does not, JavaScript does not have anything of, of that. So you know, typically you will find that all different frameworks will uh, will scope all of the symbols that they introduce into your uh, into your execution environment inside of global, right? So they will call it, uh, for example, how many of you use y, uh, Yahoo UI library? Right, so you'll say y u i dot. I mean, it's a little too verbose, <laughs> my opinion. But you'll say y u i dot. That's y u i two. Y u i three is just y. He said y u i two is this. Y u i three is y. Just y. And then jQuery is dollar. Correct. So you know, for example, this is a global. So y here is a global. When you include the Yahoo UI library, the entire library is basically you know <coughs> branched off this single global variable. This could be one use case among the very few use cases where globals make sense. In fact, uh, <laughs> this is another what in JavaScript. So if you have some function like this, right? Boo equals 10, I say. Or let's use some variable that I haven't used before. I might have used boo. Zoo equals 1, all right? So I call this function here. So zoo, I mean, whatever. The function got called, zoo got initialized. Now what do you think is going to happen if I print zoo here? How many think undefined? Blah, blah, blah. See, it says there's one, right? So what is actually happening here? It gets declared with the current scope. Right. You give it, you, we haven't talked about the scope. Where the function is if we talk about the scope, then we'll know where exactly the variable is getting hoisted. Correct. So, so here, when I just said zoo equals one, JavaScript doesn't complain, right? It goes ahead and creates a variable called zoo. And where does it create? In the, in the, in the context for this particular function. Okay, we haven't talked about context. Oh, one second. What yeah. if I put this dot zoo equal to one? What if I do ah. this dot zoo equal to one? Or let's say let's make it uh, ten, right, to distinguish from the older example. So what do you think will print here? Ten. Ten. Yeah, so it's exactly the same. It prints ten. 
the current context of that function when you execute to write, that's going to be the window object. <coughs> yes. So the variable hoisting, the variable declaration will go on to the current object. That's so when you window. call foo like this, what is this inside foo? That's the a global object. object. Global object. Unless right. it's ES5. Uh, strict mode. In ES5, yes, strict mode, mode it won't be. Uh, but otherwise it will be. So if you, uh, or you can explicitly associate a context like that, yeah. in which case this will be that object. Anyway. So that's uh, that's another thing. So you know what? The, 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 the tricky thing here is this. Let's say you declare zoo, okay, and did this. You see the difference there? In the declaration, the Z is capital. When I used it, I used smaller case. No error. Right? So this is the this is the painful part. So I guess folks are streaming in for the next session. One last question. Yeah. Uh, can you give me some use case for call and apply? Yeah. Oh, the what? Sorry? Call. Call, call and apply. Call and apply, apply method. You want to know the difference? No, I just want to know in use what case, case we are we can be made use of. Okay, so typically if you have a function where you want to explicitly specify the context in which that particular function is going to be called, you will use call. Right? And uh, this the first parameter is the context, second parameter, subsequent parameter are the parameters of the function. When you say apply, uh, it's exactly, exactly the same thing. First parameter is the context, and second parameter is basically the array. I mean, basically the idea is if you have uh, some function which, which you want to invoke, where the parameters that you want to pass to that function is dynamically uh, constructed. Maybe you're making an Ajax call, you're getting the data back, and now you want to call this function, and these functions have to be passed as parameters. There is no way you can do that unless you use eval, where you dynamically construct your script and call that function, which is, as you know, easily. Uh, so what is the correct way to do it? You basically populate an array with all the parameters, call apply, and basically the runtime will take care of unpacking this array and calling the function, passing the parameters. So another yes. use case would be uh, yes. applying array yes. prototype yes. methods on array-like objects like node lists and all. So there are array-like objects like argument node lists which don't have all the array methods like sort and filter and all. So you can say array dot prototype dot filter and you can get the object itself which is like an array right. and it will apply that method. Taking this to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks,